So will you please extend your hand to Pastor? We want to bless her. We are so grateful for her. She is a blessing in every way. So Lord, we just thank you for Pastor Juanita. We thank you for her heart, her servant's heart. We thank you for the impact that she has on each one of us and on this community. Lord, we just ask for your extended grace and anointing to be on her always. Lord, we ask for your blessing, the Father's blessing that is abundant and never ending. Lord, we pray that you would just bless her day, today through Tuesday and for the rest of her days here on earth, Lord. May she be a continued witness of your glory and your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We love you. Thank you. So um, we're so excited. We, uh, Brittany and um, her family are going to move to Arizona, and she would like to be baptized yeah. before they move. We thought today was her last Sunday, but we get her for a couple more weeks. So we won't say goodbye like we were thinking today. I asked her if she could stay till the 19th for the potluck, and she said, no, the movers are coming the day before, so that's okay. But um, we're going to ask James and Brittany to come up. And uh, Brittany, I think we'll go ahead and start with you first. And... Um, and <laughs> Oh, we got, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so, so Brittany, uh, and we're, uh, Bruce is going to take some pictures. We're going to uh, see if, uh, for online, if those here can just be seated. But if you need to stand, please feel free to, to stand. Um, so, Brittany, do you have a towel or do you have a, okay. <laughs> All right, well, we are so excited to um, walk with you in this baptism um, before you leave, and I'm so sad that you're leaving, though, but I know that God is going with you, and, and we're going to pray a blessing um, for you and your family Thank to you. be used in mighty ways. So is there anything you want to say before you get into the tank? I did. <laughs> I just want to thank this church family. Um, it was extremely difficult for me to take the steps to come here, but I feel at home, and I appreciate you guys, and I love being a part of this family, and I'm yeah. going to miss you guys. Yes, we're going to miss you terribly. <laughs> thank you. Praise God. Uh, come on in. And, uh, yes, it's, it's No, it's very warm. It's very warm. <laughs> very Mr. Blevins did a good job. Uh, yes. So, uh, Brittany, who will you choose to follow the rest of the days of your life? Jesus Christ. All right. We're going to baptize you. And um, we're so excited that as you go under the water, we're leaving all that yuck and all that sin and everything behind, and you're raised up just as Christ was raised on the third day, a new person, and excited for what God's doing in your life. So uh, um, I'm going to... Baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, Jesus. Give God a little victory. <laughs> yes. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. It's all right. It's just carpet. Leon says it's okay. It's just water. <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you. Praise God. Let's take a praise. praise God one more time. And James, come on up. James, come on up. We're so excited with you. Is there anything that you would like to say? Uh, I'm new here. Yes. Amen. Thank you guys for Amen. welcoming, welcoming yes. me to your church. Yes. yes. Praise the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Thank Amen. You. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise, praise God. God. We're so excited for this uh, outwards step of what God has done already in your life and the journey that you are on with him every day, walking closer with him. So, James, who do you choose to follow all the rest of the days of your life? Uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, all right. We are going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right, let's go back to some worship and we'll give God some more glory for what he's doing. Anybody else? Anybody, Anybody else? else? <laughs>
anybody else. All right. All right. Amen. Thank All you, Sandy. Right. I just wanted to read something I read last night. And if you're, if you're reading along with the one-year Bible, uh, this is Psalms 97. The Lord is king. Let the lo earth rejoice. Let the fastest, farthest coastlines be glad. Dark clouds surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire spreads ahead of him and burns up all his foes. His lightning flashes out across the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord. Before the Lord of all the earth, the heavens proclaim his righteousness. Every nation sees his glory. Those who worship idols are disgraced. All who brag about his worthless gods, for every god must bow to him. There's, there's no other gods in, in Jesus' name, right? No, no one's going to, everybody's going to worship the Father. And I'm, I'm so glad to see these people that um, have followed the Lord in baptism. I've done that not too long ago. And Thank you, worship team. We're going to let the kiddos, fifth grade and under, go downstairs with Miss, with Miss Debra. Thank you, Debra, and all of our, our uh, workers and the kids. Um, and the nursery is open if you choose to use it. I say, welcome, welcome <laughs> today. Thank you. I mean, you feel his presence here today. Amen. Amen. Thank you. It is uh, a busy, fun day, right? Chaotic. Uh, we're in the house of the Lord, and this is exactly where we should be in the house of the Lord. Um, I told Mr. Blevins, as I like to call him, that he might end up in a sermon, in a message. And I'll just open up with him. We'll just get it, get out, out of the way. <laughs> so <laughs> a few days ago, he woke me up out of a very sound, peaceful, peaceful sleep. He just was sitting on the edge of the bed, and he reaches out and, and touches me and puts his hand on me. And, he, and I, it's not uh, 6 a.m., it's not 8 a.m., and it's certainly not 10 in the morning. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. And I wake up and say, what's wrong, what's wrong? And he says, nothing. I just want to be with you. <laughs> and he's totally serious. <laughs> and I'm a little shocked, and, and amazingly, I smile and laugh a little bit, and I say, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, he proceeds to take me downstairs because he has a YouTube video that he would like me to watch with him. <laughs> he said, I think you will enjoy this. Um, and he went on to say, I just never get to spend time with you when you're, when you're awake, and I miss your company. Uh, and he was right. I did enjoy the video. Uh, but after about 30 minutes, I tell, can tell that Eric is just kind of settling in the pain meds, which might be a little bit responsible for what's going on here. I was working, and I look over and I say, what you doing? And he says, well, I, I'm thinking about taking a little rest, but I think you'll be mad at me since I woke you up. <laughs> I laughed, and I say, go ahead. Go ahead and rest. Go back to sleep. And I, he did, and I went and crawled back in my nice cozy bed once again. <laughs> but it did make me wonder. When God wakes you up at 3 in the morning, has he ever woken you up yeah. in the middle of the night out of a sound, peaceful sleep? Yes. Just wanting to spend some time with us. Just before the day gets busy and, and life gets chaotic, and when he has our full attention, he just wants to spend some time with us. Yesterday, I woke up with a song on my mind that was popular, I think, about 10 years ago. <laughs> Lord, I'm amazed by you, how you love me. You dance over me while I am unaware. You sing all around, but I never hear a sound. Lord, I'm amazed by you, how you love me. It goes on to say, how wide, how deep, and how great is your love for me. Amen. I pray that you feel that love, his love today. Heavenly Father, I am so grateful for you today. I am grateful for each one. 
that you've stirred within our hearts to bring us to your house today. Lord, I ask you would be with the babies in the nursery. Lord, bless the workers as they care for your little ones. I ask that you would be with the kids downstairs, God, as they're learning about you. Lord, give them excitement and a desire and creativity to be and hunger and thirst for your word and to be in your presence just as we expressed. We here that have, have, have fallen you, we saw in water baptism beautiful examples of saying, I want to let everyone know that you are my Lord. You are my Savior, and I choose to follow you the rest of my life. Lord God, I'm not sure if I'm totally honest where this message is going today, but I feel your spirit. I ask that you would get Juanita totally out of the way. That Holy Spirit, you would move. You have complete freedom to do as you would do, as you would like in this service today. We thank you, we praise you, we give you all honor, we give you all glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. and amen. 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 All right, so I have a couple of thoughts, I think, before I get to the message, and I'm, I think I'll probably end up just bringing half of the message that I prepared. We're just going to see what God has in store. I would like to end uh, with a time of, of communion um, together. Um, I thought we were going to pray with Brittany, but I'm so glad that Jesse and Brittany, we get you for a couple more weeks, and Denise as well. So um, I have a real desire to hear from, from you, God's people, what he is doing in your lives. What has he been doing in the last couple months? What has he been doing in the last couple years? And giving our testimony is a really important part of our recovery, our faith walk, um, and so in Celebrate Recovery, we have a 12-step small group. And, and part of that, at the end of it, we're encouraged to write our testimony, a 20-minute to 30-minute testimony. And there's a training, and there's a procedure, and there's a workshop to teach us how to do that. And it's beautiful. It's a wonderful thing. And we're able to share in front of not only our own group here, but once we've done that, we're able to share and go to other Celebrate Recoveries in, in the area. And God uses that for his glory, what he's done in our lives as we share our testimony with others. But I wonder if we could break it down simpler. As I just as I said, I just have a desire um, to hear, perhaps on a Sunday morning, from some of you, a two or three minute or a sentence, what God is doing in your lives. My friend uh, Tina, pastor in Granby, gave this a challenge to her congregation um, over Easter, and she wrote on index cards, and it was just a simple fill-in-the-blank sentence about the transformational power of Jesus Christ. And her congregation gave beautiful testimonies that started out with, I was once, blank, fill in the blank, um, but because of Jesus, I am now. And some uh, was, um, I was living in shame, but because of the transformational power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I am now living in honor with my Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Very simple, very simple. How about this one? I was alone and afraid, angry, defensive, and cruel at times, lost, and often felt abandoned. But because of the transformational power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I am fulfilled, powerful. I am loved and can love others. I have peace and joy in my heart. I have wise counsel of the Holy Spirit and his grace. I am privileged to claim my identity as a child of the Most High King. I am saved, sealed in his blood, and because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. So it begs the question, who talked to you about Jesus? Who was the one that impacted you, who shared their faith, perhaps before you knew God? before you knew him and maybe walked away from him and came back to him. In my case, that was I was a pastor's kid, grew up in um, the pastor's home and walked away as a young adult. And after five years, it was my dad who uh, wanted to meet with me. And um, 
he said, why don't you, why don't you come around anymore? And I said, because I don't love the God you love. And he said, but I still love you. We still love you. And that simple sentence was what brought me back to God. That unconditional love of my earthly father representing my heavenly father brought me back. And often those who impact our lives and the lives of others, they might not be well known to others. They not, might not be the ones standing behind the pulpit. They might not have a position in the church. And we at Praise Church have a heart for evangelism and for witnessing. And I feel that God is stirring the waters there. He is opening the doors. We're talking about building the, the new porch, and, and we're, we're coming up against obstacles. And we say we believe it's going to happen. And it's not for our glory, but it's for his glory. It's a sign to the community that this is an alive church. So come on in. We're welcoming. And we know that the living God is here. We can meet with him here. But the question is, what is the difference between evangelism and witnessing. So real quick before we get into the me message, witnessing can be said, your actions are speaking so loud, your actions are speaking so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. In biblical uh, categories, witnessing involves making visible what is otherwise invisible. The reality to which we bear witness is the invisible kingdom of God. And in witnessing, we strive to make the Lord's reign visible. Among, there are many ways we can bear witness to Jesus is through loving others. We reveal to the word that we belong to our Savior when we love others. And when he comes to sharing our faith, our former superintendent, George uh, Wood, said, uh, stated our faith should be caught, not taught. <laughs> Not that we don't use words or go to the Holy Scriptures, but for those who do not know Jesus or don't know the Word of God or the Christian lingo, it's by our actions, our living out our faith that can cause them to see a difference and say, what do you have? I know you're going through something, that, but you have something different in your life. How can you be like that? Can you tell me how I can be that way as well? I think, Dale, you talk about that. People stop you in town and say, boy, brother, you've changed a little bit. What's going on? What's going on? John 13, 34 through 35, he says, by, um, by all this all we know that you are my disciples if you love one, if you have love for one another. Evangelism means literally gospeling. Gospeling, that's fun to say. When we evangelize, we are gospeling. We're announcing, we're declaring, we're bringing forth, preaching the good news. We are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in the word evangelism, I was going to put it on the screen but failed to, you can the word angel is tucked in there. Angel is a, mes a mes messenger, yes. They practice evangelism or sharing the good news of Jesus. So the distinction between witnessing and evangelism is important because it's easy to think we are evangelizing when really we're just doing, we're bearing witness to our Lord and Savior. Giving one's testimony is very, very important. It's a good thing. But it may not be evangelism testifying to the work of God in our lives, bearing witness to what Christ has done for us, in itself does not give the content or may not give the content of the gospel. Living a righteous life manifests the works of the Holy Spirit, but we have not evangelized to our neighbors if we've never shared the gospel with them. No one is confer converted simply out of kindness or honesty they have to be brought they are brought to the kingdom of heaven only through repentance through Jesus Christ so what does evangelism mean it means preaching announcing otherwise communicating the gospel our salvation it's delivering the message that Jesus Christ is not only the son of God but also that he gave his life as a sacrifice for our sins. And in doing so, he ensures us eternal life. 
for anyone who believes. John 3.16, I hope you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. 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 John 14.6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Two simple scriptures. Jesus had a message, one he came to earth to deliver, teach, die, and rise again for every one of us and every one that we know. Spreading the gospel is important to Jesus. And as the Bible tells us, Jesus came so that we may live. We may be rise to life again. Jesus wants everyone to know the truth so they can be part of the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. And so I'm not sure where that's going, but I do feel like God is leading us to uh, share our testimony, share our witness, go out and do some evangelizing. Um, I'm not sure what doors are going to be open, but will you agree to pray with me uh, in what God will do for us um, and lead us to for our own families, for our community, for those that we know. Uh, one thing I think Yvette mentioned it this week on Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. A very simple thing. We have gathered with just a handful of other believers from other churches. Yeah, for um, at noon, and usually we're done by 12:30, and um, we gather there and we just. Uh, Circle up and say prayer. So I invite you to come if your schedule allows uh, on the at the courthouse uh, in front of the flag there at noon on Thursday. Okay, it's Thursday, isn't it? Thursday, the second, yeah, the National Day of of Prayer. So um, this last week, Sandy mentioned it a little bit. We have been reading through the one year Bible, and I hope that you are reading with us. For some of us, it's new journey. For some, it's not. But each day we open to the whatever the date is and we read a part of the Old Testament, the New Testament, a Psalms, and a Proverbs. And if it, that is uh, a little challenging for you, I encourage you to keep with it. Uh, perhaps just read the New Testament part. Perhaps just read the Psalms. Uh, whatever it is, just get into the habit of going to the Word of God every day and, and opening it up. So this week we read, I uh, wanted to highlight, we started this, uh, the book of Judges, if you're reading along with this. And um, the book of Judges is the seventh book in the Old Testament, and it tells us a lot about the nature and character of God. God is not a pushover, is he? <laughs> but rather, he's an active father who disciplines his children that he loves. There's 12 judges in the book of Judges. We read about Deborah this last week. I hope you I hope you are reading with me. The only female judge of Israel. Deborah was a wise leader. She could see the big picture. She was not power hungry. She wanted only to serve God. Yet she didn't deny or resist her position. Her story shows God can accomplish great things through people who are willing. And today we're going to recount the scriptures of Gideon. And uh and coming up in the next days, we'll read about Samson. Samson gets more chapters in the book of Judges, but Gideon gets more verses overall. So Gideon is the only judge in the book who has doubts. He asks God for two signs even after the angel of God appears to him. As if the angel wasn't appearing wasn't enough, God give me two more signs. He's full of questions and doubt. And in chapters um, 6, verses 1 through 6, we hear the Israelites did evil in the eyes of God. And there's a lot of scriptures. So I'm not going to read it all for you, but they, he, they did evil in the eyes of God, and they ended up homeless, hungry, and humiliated. The Lord handed them over. The enemy hordes were as thick as locusts, it says, they had nothing to eat, no nourishment. They were reduced to starvation by the enemy. And they lost their homes. They lost their security. And they had to hide in caves. And by the way, all of that is a really good picture of what sin does to us, isn't it? 
You may have heard this. Sin takes you further than you want to go, charges you more than you want to pay, and keeps you longer than what you want to stay. Sin. So the Israelites are homeless. They're hungry and they're humiliated. And the Midianites brought them very low. In verse 6, it says, And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. They finally come to the place where they are ready to cry out to God. And we pick up in verse 7 with God's response to the Israelites crying out. And the scripture says in verse 7 of chapter 6 of Judges, when, when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites. And why? Because they were homeless, they were hungry, and they were humiliated. They came to a place where they knew they needed God's help. And this is how salvation starts for all of us. All we bring in our salvation is our own sin, our own failure, and our need. And this is where the Israelites were. C.S. Lewis says, God whispers to us every day, but shouts to us in our pain. Here the Israelites are experiencing a lot of pain. They're living in caves. They're starving. And some of you are experiencing a lot of pain right now. And pain is one of the ways God tries to get our attention. Not always, but he can use pain, and we should pay attention. Verse 7, when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. And this is how God responds. Normally, God sends a leader, he sends a deliverer, he sends a judge. But in this case, in verse 8, we hear God's solution. He says, and the Lord sent a prophet to the Lord, to the people of Israel. To do what? Basically preach a sermon, preach a message. They didn't just need to be saved. They needed a sermon first. They just didn't need to be rescued. They needed God's revelation. They didn't just need to be delivered. There was something declared to them. And it was very, very important. This is why teaching and preaching on our Bible studies and our small groups on Sunday morning and, and Celebrate Recovery small groups and our step studies are very important because we need to understand who God is and who you are, what God has done for you, and what's your condition before God. And if you don't understand those things, if you don't understand your identity in Christ, you will keep making the same mistakes you've been making. We call that insanity. <laughs> we keep doing the same thing again and again, over and over, expecting different results. We need to know our identity in Christ. Verse 7, when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, verse 8, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel, and he said to them, thus says the Lord, of God of Israel. And when you hear that, it is the gospel of the Old Testament. God declares the good news. He's declaring what God has done. We're getting ready to hear. There's a lot of eyes in the statements coming up. And God is talking about the gospel. He said, I led you out of Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. I saved you from Satan, sin, and death. I saved you from the penalty and the power and the pollution of sin. Verse 9 goes on to say, And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the one, the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. So here's what he's saying. I saved you. I gave you my word, I gave you my promises, and that's enough. And that is what God says today to us. I've saved you, I've given you my word, and I will never, never, never forsake you. I've told you that I'm better than sin. I told you that I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. I told you that I'm going to walk 
with you every step of the way. We don't just earn our salvation. We don't work for our salvation. We work from our salvation. And God goes on to say, but you have not obeyed my voice. Gideon is about to be reduced, and we heard that the angel of the Lord, it's different from the angel of the Lord, is different from an, an angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord only appears a handful of times in the Old Testament. He appeared to Abraham in Genesis 18, Moses in Exodus 3, and Joshua 5. And he always appears to the leaders for a specific task and gives them his word. In verse 11, and now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terabith at Oprah. Not to be confused with Oprah, <laughs> Winfrey, <laughs> right? When belonged to Joash the Aborites, while his son Gideon was beating out the wheat in the wine press. That sounds normal. <laughs> but he was hiding for the Midianites. And what I want us to see today is how God called Gideon and how God calls you. The call of God of our life starts with saying, stop hiding. We heard that last week. Stop hiding. Juanita, stop hiding. Quit running. And this is what's going on in Gideon. He's sifting wheat in a wine press, not on the threshing floor. And you might think that's normal, but it's not. Because when you sift wheat, you go to the highest place. You go to the top of the mountain where there's wind. You go where there's most open space because you throw the wheat up and all the light stuff goes, blows away and the heavy stuff falls down to the floor, and that's the stuff that you want. But here we're getting a kind of a silly picture of Gideon. He's hiding in a wine press, which is a dark place, in the ground with no wind. And by implications... We are hiding. When you're hiding, everything we do is more difficult. And so he's hiding, but God does not rebuke him for hiding. He comes to him. And it says it's interesting that many times if someone, what someone fears, let's say the ocean, let's say if you're afraid of the ocean, and we often say, don't, don't be afraid of the ocean, but they say really the best thing to do is to talk about that the ocean's really a, a bad place. It, it can be fearful. It can be dangerous. And that's why it keeps trying to throw you out, but we want them to face their fear. The real solution is to look what it looks like for you to confront your fear. A person does not overcome fear by being isolated from it. They overcome fear by voluntarily and incrementally confronting it. So what do you fear today? Many of us have a fear of rejection. Why didn't you apply for school or the job interview? Because you didn't want to get rejected. Why didn't you ask somebody to do something? Because you didn't want to be rejected. And one of the reasons we don't share God with our neighbors and is because we don't want to be rejected. As Americans, we don't necessarily fear the raised fist. It's said we fear the raised eyebrow. And maybe not that our neighbors are going to hurt us, but they might think we are strange. They might look at us differently. And that's the worst thing. We're afraid of being rejected. A lot of people are afraid of the future. Will I be single forever? Will I be able to buy a house? Am I going to get some sort of illness or injury or sickness? And we may not go to the doctor for years out of fear, right? Even though we have symptoms, we don't want to go because we have fear. I went seven years ago. That's, I was fine then. I don't need to go again. <laughs> fear of commitment is also one. We don't say yes. We don't say no. We say maybe. But God comes to Gideon in his hiding. So it makes us ask the question, if we are honest, where are you hiding today? 
In one sense, we're hiding from God, hiding from God in a very old story. And it's the first thing we see from Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 after they sin. Think about it. God's very first interaction with mankind after sin is them hiding. And God said, Adam, where are you? And it's not that God didn't know where Adam was. It was that Adam didn't know where Adam was. Adam, Adam had to admit, I'm hiding. Because to know God is to know what we should do. And people tend not to want to go to those things. They hide in places. There's a very old saying, what you want most, what you most want to find is where you least want to look. It means what you most need to find is where you have not been looking. And that is why you will find it there, because you're afraid to look there. It's like, what is the one thing you don't want to talk about in your marriage or in a relationship with somebody? That's exactly what you really need to talk about. You probably need to have that conversation so you can stop hiding from one another and start telling the truth to each other. And this is where it all starts. God comes to Gideon in his hiding and calls him out of it. I must say that our families are in the place where they are because they've been hiding. Our church is where it's at because we have been hiding. Our city, our town, because people have been hiding. We've not been taking the responsibility what God has called us to. And the reason you can come out of hiding is because Christ died for you. And that's the truth. We can come out of hiding because Jesus Christ died in our place so that we can actually be uncomfortably exposed in our sin and foolishness. Everyone starts out a sinner, out as a sinner. We can come out and say, I know my relationships in a mess I'm struggling with addiction I don't know anything about what I'm doing in this area of my life but I'm going to come out of hiding because Christ has forgiven me and because Christ will empower me and so in verse 12 the Lord the the angel appeared the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him the Lord is with you O mighty man of valor and this is interesting. Here's Gideon. He's talking to Gideon, and it's, he's calling him almighty man of valor. He's hiding in a wine press. But God is not looking at where he's at at the moment. He's looking at what and who Gideon could actually be. Amen. He's going to call you for who you could be. Your primary identity in Christ is someone um, that Christ died for. The whole idea that your identity comes before your activity. You have to have identity in Christ for what he's done for you and what, for what God has said about you. Your identity can't be that this is the family I'm from, from that's secondary, or I'm rooted in your age or your stage of life or your sexual identity. Those identities are not your primary identity in life. Your primary identity in life is that you're a Christ follower yeah. and that you are someone who Christ died for and cared for. Right. And in verse 14, we see that he speaks to Gideon and he calls him out of hiding and he gives him the identity and then look at how Gideon responds in verse 13. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all the wonderful deeds your fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us to the hands of the Midianites. In other words, why are we suffering? If the Lord is with us, then why is this happening to us? And Gideon's actually asks, asking, Why did you leave us? But God's saying, I didn't leave you. You left me. So this is what God does. He calls us out of our hiding. He calls us. God tells us where we need to see ourselves rightly and biblically 
in his identity. And he calls us to stop complaining and start obeying. So Gideon is praying, but he's really complaining. And there's two questions that probably each of us ask one time or the other. Why is there so much suffering? And why doesn't God seem to be moving like he did in the past? We'll see in verse 14 Gideon's response. God says, and the Lord turned to him. That's the language of I'm looking at you. (laughs) I've got you in my sight. I've got something to say to you. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And here's what he's saying. Gideon, when you ask me the question, why is there so much poverty? I want to ask you the same question. Why is there so much poverty in our world? Why is there so much racism? And God wants to ask us. We say, God, why are there so many lost people in my workplace? And God is like, I'd actually want to ask you the same question. Why is there so many lost people in your worst workplace or in your family? And sometimes we have not the best spirit and we want to say, I think I'm the only Christian here. I'm the only one. I'm the last one. Everybody from my family is not serving God. Everybody that I work with is not serving God. And we start to ask, is God real? Is God going to save these people? Is God going to be faithful? And God is asking you the very same question. Are you going to be faithful? Are you going to step out of hiding? Are you going to stop complaining? And as we wrap up before communion, there is a difference between a servant and a critic. Both a servant and a critic see that something's wrong, something's amiss. But a critic just tells you all about what's wrong. It's terrible. (laughs) I can't believe they said that. But a servant says, oh, I see it. Maybe I can be of help. I see it. I've got a skill set. Maybe God wants to use me for this problem. Matthew 9.38, Therefore we pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out the laborers into the harvest. Scripture says, Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. And then he sends the disciples into the harvest. God is calling us out to be his hands and feet. He's asking us, and we're asking him, Lord, do you see that there's so many lost people? Do you see that nobody around me knows you? And he says, yes. What are you going to do about it, Juanita? Are you going to share? Do you have a heart to evangelize? Do you have a heart to witness? We're going to close in a time of communion. And in this week's reading from Luke, um, I thought it was very personal and I would like to to read it. But uh, if we can, and if you would like to share communion, let's, um, we have some here and some at the back table. Uh, It's open communion. If you're a Christ follower, we'd welcome you to uh, come and share and communion with us. But today we'll do it as a family together. So if you would like, please uh, come and get the elements and then you can um, return to your seat and we'll take it together as we read through the scripture. And if you uh, do not want to, please don't, you don't have to leave. You can sit and and join it. We won't take us very long um, as we take the communion together. Sorry. (laughs) So each week we Uh, receive communion in different ways, just as a reminder of what Christ's sacrifice was on the cross. You can hold this. Because it's easy to live our daily lives and forget 
his great sacrifice. I'm going to be reading out of Luke 22 um, from the New Living, and I apologize, it will not be on the screen, but it is out of our one-year Bible, so if you are reading along this, this week, you'll have heard it. Luke 22, starting with verse 14. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. And Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you. Have you been eager to eat the Passover meal? Have you been eager to come to his house this week to worship, to spend time with him in table, table fellowship? He goes on to say, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. I want to gather strength with you, with my brothers and my sisters, before my strength, my suffering begins. I want to fellowship with you. I want to break bread with you. I want to sit at the table with you before my suffering begins before this week, busyness begins, before life gets crazy and distracted. Verse 16, for I tell you now, for I tell you now, listen up, pay attention. There's a few things I want to tell you. There's a few things I want to let you know as we sit together in table fellowship. Listen for my voice. Focus on me. And if you would like, if you would like to stand as we get to verse 17. Stand with me if you wouldn't mind. I'm going to take off the top layer. This is the, the hard part. And, he's, and he says, I might have. He says, I will not eat this meal again until it's been filled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks for it. And he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I will not drink this wine again until the kingdom of God has come. So we're going to... I, let's, if we can open it... <laughs> I'm not going to drink this until I come again. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blood that was shed for us, that we can be eager to meet with you. We can be eager to hear your voice. We can be eager to listen for your correction, for your obedience, for your prompting to come out of hiding. We thank you for your blood that was given on the cross. In Jesus' name, I'm going to take the cup. In verse 19, then he took some bread, broke it, and gave thanks to God, and then gave it to his disciples. This is my body given unto you. My body will be beaten, bruised, and sacrificed. My very lifeblood will be poured on the ground for you. Can you say your own prayer before you take the bread? Stop and thank him for his sacrifice, his body being beaten and broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Don't forget. Don't forget. Keep me close. Keep me close. And in verse 20, after supper, he took another cup, the third cup. And this is the cup of the new covenant, the covenant between God and his people in agreement, confirmed by his blood, which was poured out for you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Today, I hope that you are challenged, those around you. 
to witness, to testify, looking for opportunities to evangelize in our community, in our families, to think about where you might be hiding. Maybe you're in the wine press instead of on the threshing floor where, where we might be hiding. Sandy, do you have a song you want to sing us out? And then at the end of this, we will just be dismissed. And please um, greet each other. Go with God. And um, we will see you on Wednesday for CR and Day of Prayer on Thursday. Thursday night prayer as well.